All right, testing, testing, one, two, three, testing. Let's see. We're actually doing it. This is amazing. Yep, it's actually working. It's pretty cool. All right, let's uh, try to get this show on the road, I guess. Assuming my computer doesn't explode. All right, here we go. Greetings, greetings, travelers. Apologies for being a few minutes late. We're attempting to do some things here to uh, make the stream better and make the overall uh, experience better. Uh, we actually just upgraded ourselves to more of a pro streaming setup, and so we're actually able to stream to Facebook and to YouTube and here on Twitch all at the same time. We are now live. We are multi streaming. So that's a pretty cool upgrade. But there was some extra setup stuff that I had to do that I didn't know I had to do. So. Took care of that, and here we go. Hopefully you and yours are doing well wherever you happen to be. If you're new to the channel, please feel free to click that subscribe button if you haven't already. Ring the little bell for notifications on any platform, so Twitch, uh, Facebook, uh, click that like button on Facebook, or uh, over here on YouTube as well. Whatever you happen to be using, we hope you are doing well. My name's Mike, and this is uh, my wife and I. We own this channel called Earthshine Education. Uh, this is what we do. Uh, we do planetarium shows Mondays and Wednesdays. Fridays, we sit around and talk about the news. And by the news, I mean astronomy news. This channel is primarily about astronomy, but we will likely talk about... Earth science and space, other spaces, other spaces, other space sciences, uh, as well as, you know, atmospheric science or things like that. Uh, what you are seeing is a stream broadcast from our computer here, uh, from our little streaming studio in our beautiful home in Rio Rancho, New Mexico. We hope you'll see you around uh, for future shows. And uh, occasionally you might hear a cat meow or you might hear a dog growl or something. That's that's our lovely family. We have Sirius the Dachshund and we have Alcyone the cat. Long hair American, supposedly. I think she's a Siberian. Shh. Anyway, uh, you might hear them in the background. Uh, and, like anything else, uh, with live animals, sometimes things get a little wild. So, hopefully they will be calm throughout the show. So that we can show things off to you. Now, what you are going to be seeing... Okay, good. Everything is ready to go. Perfect. What you are going to be seeing will be changing. What you see right now is actually our planetarium software. This is something called Stellarium. You can download it for free. 
stellarium.org s-t-e-l-l-a-r-i-u-m stellarium it's like a star and a planetarium stellarium get it got it good all right again it's free stellarium.org hey buddy there's no more treats i already gave it to you hey bub i'm on serious come lay down so on our little planetarium here we're gonna be showing you around the sky for the next couple of evenings mm, talking a little bit about the planets talk about what you can see if you have a telescope how to find your way around the sky now we've intentionally set it up there's no horizon you see it's just this gray circle or uh, sorry green circle and you'll notice we've got uh, little markers denoting which directions we got an S down here for south E over here for east which means west is over there what you're seeing right now is actually a representation of the sky outside right now with no clouds perfectly placed from where I live so this may vary depending on where you happen to be and that's okay let's go ahead and uh, get time moving we will occasionally swap to other things uh, for example what we normally start out with is this no not that that's the surprise dang it <laughs> what we normally start out with is actually this astronomy picture of the day uh, this is a website you can find just type it into any of your favorite search engines just type in astronomy picture of the day or a pod and you will get this list. It goes back all the way to 1995. It's been a little wonky lately. Certain browsers don't like certain things with it, but I digress. Uh, we always kind of start off with this and look at a couple of different things. Uh, every day they put a different photo up. Uh, so it's always kind of a nice little, you know, warm up before we start our planetarium show to kind of look through and uh, just talk about a couple of different things. Like here we've got a picture from... Uh, let's see, when did they put this up? This was put up on the 1st, so this was the New Year photo. What do we got? We got stars, lots of stars. We got galaxies, look at that. Galaxies on the South Celestial Pole. So if you don't know what you're looking at, uh, there's always an explanation in the subtext there. And there's always a preview that always says what tomorrow's title will be. Uh, and again, you can just click through and read. Uh, these are really, really cool. Um... Today's is actually a, a video, so sometimes you get videos. Uh, today's is actually sprites, so again, not always just astronomy, but you also get space sciences, and you also get uh, atmospheric sciences and earth sciences mixed in, because uh, they're all kind of branches of the same thing. There we go. Uh, if you don't know what a sprite is, they're actually uh, lightning, uh, really, really high up in the atmosphere. We don't really know how they work, but they do happen. Uh, they are plasma irregularities, and they look really, really, really cool. Uh, so again, if you want to learn more about that, just click on the link uh, that you see. Sirius, come on, buddy. And uh, so, yeah. Uh, one last one. Looks like this was a third, so this would have been yesterday. That is really cool. Uh, that is a aurora, so the aurora borealis, the northern or southern lights. In this case, it's over Iceland, so that's a northern light. And what you see here is actually energy from the sun bouncing off of particles in our own atmosphere and uh, those particles give off those, those molecules I should say give off light they glow in different colors depending on which molecule is excited it just happens to look like a phoenix that's a really really cool uh, image to have and again if you roll over it you'll see there's these little lines so these lines actually denote what we call constellations we're going to learn about some of them here in just a little bit so anyway uh, every time we start up we're going to start out with a pod and then switch over into our planetarium show so with that let's switch over to stellarium now the sun still hasn't set yet so we're going to speed things up it's not recommended to speed up time Time is a valuable thing, and you don't want to waste it. <laughs> the sun always rises in the east and will set in the west, so if you've noticed the sun in the sky and noticed it rising up in the early morning before you go to work or school, and you notice it setting in the west uh, on your way home, you know which directions you're looking.
All right, so here we are right at sunset tonight, a little bit after, well, it's like 5.30 or so. And here we are looking at the sky. Now, there's not a lot going on during twilight. And that's actually the best time to look for planets. You see, planets, number one, they don't twinkle. Stars twinkle, 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 little star. Planets don't twinkle. And they are the first things to show up right after the sun sets. Now, the word planet means vagabond or wanderer. It comes from planetes or planetes, I guess. It's Greek. And in antiquity, the sun and the moon were considered planets because they wandered through the sky. Obviously, they're not planets by conventional terms today, but that's what they were considered long ago. Between the sun and the moon, and there was also five other objects. Today, we call them Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. So that's a total of seven objects. So each day of the week is actually dedicated to one of these objects. So Sun, Sunday. Moon, Monday. Uh, Tuesday is actually Mars. Uh, Wednesday is Mercury. Thursday is Jupiter. Uh, Friday is Venus. And Saturday is Saturn. Saturn's day. So, seven days a week, seven classical quote-unquote planets. Uh, today we only consider five of them to be planets. And uh, you're going to be seeing a couple of them right at sunset along the horizon now. The problem with that is that they don't always stay up very long. So here we are looking at the southwestern horizon right around sunset, and we see kind of something interesting. Now, uh, this is Mercury... Saturn and Jupiter. Now, just last week we had the great, or actually about a week and a half ago now, I should say, uh, we had the great conjunction, right? We had Jupiter and Saturn so close together in the sky that uh, they look like one object, and you'll see they've actually separated a little bit in the sky. They are separate. Uh, so instead of looking like one object, or people were calling it the Christmas star, I believe, uh, there's actually two objects, of course. But also showing up now is little tiny Mercury. Now, Mercury's not up for very long at least this week, and uh, in just a few evenings, Mercury will be a little bit higher up in the sky and actually will be up here with Jupiter and Saturn. In fact, uh, let's take a look. Nope, that's not the right one. Let's do this again. There we go. I believe that's on the 9th. Yeah. So there we go. In just a few evenings, you're going to get this interesting-looking triangle in the sky. Now, people are going to freak out, I'm sure. Three bright objects uh, in a triangle. Uh, but again, that's on the 9th, uh, right at sunset, so you got about five days before that happens. So this evening, you'll see Mercury, as, actually you can see as I go back and forth days here, there's Mercury rising up. You get to the 9th, and then eh, a little bit higher, all of a sudden Mercury will start to kind of turn back around. You'll see the planets Jupiter and Saturn have gone out of view, and by the 30th, Mercury is just going to be a little bit higher up in the sky. So Mercury is going to be joining us in the evening, which will be nice. But Saturn and Jupiter will be saying goodbye to us. So please enjoy them while they are available. They've been in the sky for a few months now. Uh, they went from being in the early, early morning to being right at midnight to uh, being in the sky right at midnight to being up all night. And now they'll be leaving our sky for a little bit as we orbit around the sun. Uh, we'll take a look at these objects a little bit closer here in just a second. Mercury, as you can see, through a telescope actually wouldn't look anything like this. We're going to zoom in a little bit. Oh, God, it's going away. Come back, Mercury. It is the closest planet to the sun. It has no atmosphere. Uh, it looks like a, a big rock full of holes on its surface, and it doesn't want to cooperate, so we're just going to back out of that. Uh, the next planet we'll look at will be Jupiter, just because it's a little bit brighter, a little bit bigger. Again, this is right at sunset, so you still have some sunlight in the sky. Let's get rid of that. Now, Jupiter is the biggest planet in the solar system. When you look at it, you're not looking at its surface. You're actually looking at its upper atmosphere. And around Jupiter, you're going to notice a bunch of little satellites, what we call moons. Uh, there are four very large satellites around Jupiter. Very easily seen, I should say. Uh, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto are their names. Uh, they are in a nice flattened out plane around Jupiter's equator. Callisto's way up here. 
and you see them right along the equator. Unfortunately, the great red spot is not visible. There is a large upper atmospheric disturbance with Jupiter called the Great Red Spot. Uh, it is sometimes visible, just depends on where the planet is in its rotation. It does take about, oh, between eight and nine hours, depending on where you are on Jupiter. The rotational period's a little bit different, so the day's a little bit longer at the equator than it is at the North and South Pole. Uh, of these four, what we call Galilean satellites, they're named for Galileo Galilei, who discovered them back in 1610 through a very, very rudimentary telescope. Uh, of these four, Io, Europa, Ganymede, Callisto, uh, they're all very interesting and unique. Uh, Io is a volcanic moon. Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto are all icy. Europa is the one that everybody loves to talk about because it is a ice moon that we're pretty sure, pretty, pretty, pretty sure, that there is liquid water under that icy crust. And if there's water, the question is, is there life on Europa? Saturn, the other object that's up here. Oh, by the way, I should probably mention this. Jupiter will have a very bright white color to it. It will be glowing, but it will not be twinkling. Saturn will be much more of like a golden tinge, also glowing, but not twinkling. When you look at Saturn through a telescope or through our planetarium software here, you'll, first thing you're going to notice is the rings. Now, people like to call Saturn the ringed giant, but that's kind of a misnomer. Jupiter... Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, the outer four planets, the gas giant planets of our solar system, they have rings around them. Saturn is the only one whose rings you can actually see from the Earth. Uh, they're made of ice, reflecting back a lot of light for us to see. There is a gap in the rings. Hey, come back here. There's a gap in the rings called the Cassini Division. That's this right through there. It's also what's called the Enki Gap, hanging out in the edge right over here. Again, icy rings, very, very cool. This is kind of simulating a telescope view because when you look at Saturn through a telescope or any object through a telescope, as the Earth rotates from night to day, you'll notice your objects will start to slowly slither away from your point of view. Now, around Saturn, you also have satellites that you can see. You'll likely notice Titan hanging out over here by my mouse. Uh, Titan is the largest moon around Saturn. And uh, it has a atmosphere of... Yes, I did stop for that weird little audio. Ooh, that was not me. That was the song. That's just what it does. Uh, Saturn, uh, Saturn's moon Titan does have an atmosphere made of, of all things, methane. Methane gas. So it rains methane, liquid methane on the surface. Liquid methane in little rivers and lakes. Very intriguing little moon indeed. It's not very little, but... Each is a cute little guy. Other moon we want to talk about with Saturn is actually, let's get a little closer here, right in here called Enceladus. Now, Enceladus actually is kind of like Europa. It does have an icy crust. We're pretty sure there's water under its surface, and we know this because there's geysers spewing water out above the surface of this beautiful little moon. So there's a look at Saturn. We looked at Mercury, we looked at Jupiter, we looked at Saturn. Uh, we've also got another planet out tonight, and it's called Mars. Let's zoom out a little bit. Here we go. Now, Mars will be the only thing really in the southern sky that's really, really bright right around sunset. So here we are actually around 6.15 or so. The sun is now fully set. Uh, we got Jupiter and Saturn really low on the southwestern horizon. And we got the planet Mars hanging out really high in the southern sky. Now, Mars will glow a bright red. That's actually where it gets its name. It's the red planet. It is the bringer of war, kind of a blood red color. Uh, this is Mars, zoomed in up close. And uh, tonight looks like you will have the Tharsis region of Mars on display, which is kind of cool. Uh, Tharsis is this area with three large shield volcanoes right in here. And this extremely large volcano called Olympus Mons, or Mount Olympus. Uh, if you were to look at a map of the United States, uh, there's a what we call the Four Corners region. So that's Arizona, New Mexico, uh, Utah, and Colorado. And this one volcano, this Olympus Mons, would take up any of those states. So it's about 400 miles across. 
Although we shouldn't be using miles because this is a science show. And in science, we don't use miles. <laughs> roads, where we're going, we don't need roads. <laughs> so it's about 650 kilometers wide. It is a huge shield volcano. And uh, it does stick up slightly above the very thin Martian atmosphere. Now, Mars has an atmosphere of carbon dioxide. It does have frozen carbon dioxide at its north or south pole. Hughes millimeters or parsecs. Yeah! Well, kind of. How you doing today? Good to see you. Nice to see you, to see you nice. Uh, we do have some probes on the surface, landers on the surface, uh, the Mars Exploration Rovers, which finally expired. We do have Mars Curiosity. You're doing good? That's good to hear. Welcome to whichever stream. I'm not sure where you're at. You're either on Twitch or you're on Facebook or you're on YouTube. I don't know, but I'm hoping you're on one of them. Obviously, you are. Uh, we do have a new Mars rover that should be arriving in oh about a month or so. We'll probably do a live stream. Um... Like a reacting live stream, watching all of it happen. Uh, hopefully that goes well. We'll see. Mars, and we'll look at this a little bit later as well, but Mars does have an interesting feature on its surface uh, called Valles Marineris, is Mariner Valley. If you looked at a map of the United States once again, this canyon would cross from the, United St uh, the entire United States. So it would go all the way from Los Angeles all the way to New York. And it just looks like a little crack on the surface. Okay, zoom out. Of course, if you've played Doom, you've been to Mars before. <laughs> so, gamers, yep. We appreciate you being here. So there's a look at the planets. Now... The other thing that's very curious that you've probably noticed is that the planets seem to be in a nice line. In fact, if I let time progress, we're going to be resetting time a few times during our show. If I let time progress, you're going to notice the moon will rise up here in just a little bit. And the moon will also be very close to this line. Where is the Phobos anomaly? Possibly on Phobos. So Mars has two satellites, Phobos and Deimos. Fear and Panic. And uh, they are the moons of Mars. Uh, they are captured asteroids. And there is the moon. You'll notice it's a little bit higher. The moon kind of gets higher and lower over this line. But this line, the plane of the ecliptic, it's the line the sun travels through the sky from our point of view. The moon, the moon, the moon. That's pick a tone, right? The moon and the planets also, they don't necessarily follow the line exactly, but they're all very close to this line. We call it the plane of the ecliptic. It is also called the zodiac for this line goes through a group of constellations. There are 88 total constellations in the sky. That's the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere because they're actually different. And that line goes through 12 distinct constellations. You'll also notice that the year has 12 months. There, there's a reason behind that. They all kind of match up, don't they? Seven classical objects, planets, that we called. Seven days. Twelve constellations. Tw Twelve months. They all kind of go hand in hand. Now, the reason that this line exists requires you to think three-dimensionally and it took a long time for people to understand uh, for a very long time there was what was called the geocentric model which meant that the earth was the center of the solar system and the center of the universe and we know that's not correct although some people are self-centered enough that they think they are but i digress let's take a look at that over in a different piece of software. So let's reset this to, ah, brightness, daytime. That's not what I wanted. Let's reset that to sunset right there. Let's take a look at Universe Sandbox and take a look at this in three dimensions, shall we? So here we are. This is our solar system, in fact. Hello, Whew, that's really bright. There's our sun. You'll notice the sun is a ball of plasma and gases, uh, mostly hydrogen and helium. 
converting hydrogen into helium, and as it does that, it does release a little bit of energy, and that energy is what we call sunlight. It takes thousands of years for it to bounce around the core and bounce through the layers of the sun to eventually travel 8.4 minutes to arrive here for you to feel it and feel nice and warm on a nice sunny day. Now, you'll notice there's convection areas on the surface. These are these cell-looking things that you see along the surface, quote-unquote, of the sun. Darker areas are going to be areas that are cooler, so that's stuff that's actually being pulled back into the sun. The brighter areas are stuff that's bubbling out from the interior of the star itself. Uh, there are occasionally what we call sunspots. I don't see any in this simulation, and that's okay. There's little dark spots that can appear on the sun uh, that are highly magnetic and very, very cold compared to the rest of the surface of the sun. Now, you don't want to stare at the sun with your eyes. Uh, you can and will damage them if you do that, especially if you're looking through a telescope. You want to use filters uh, or, you know, secondary viewing way, you know, reflections and things like that, shadows, uh, to see the sun. So please don't stare at the sun. Please, please, please don't do that. Let's zoom out. We talked about the inner four planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Here are their orbits. As we kind of look around kind of see already that plane of the ecliptic showing up, right? Staring at the sun is a bright idea. Yeah, yes and no, that's a funny pun. It's also a terrible idea for your eyeballs. Here's Mercury up close, a little bit different from the two-dimensional view we had. This is more of a three-dimensional view. You can see there are some areas that are kind of elevated. There's very deep craters on the surface, very scarred surface indeed there is no atmosphere so on the side facing the sun it's going to be very very hot on the surface but you're not going to feel it so to speak so you can't walk outside with nothing on you have to have a spacesuit on or you'll just kind of die and even if you did you'd have very extreme surface uh, temperature changes so if you stood right along this equ equatorial line here what we call the terminator uh the bright and dark kind of differences there uh if you're on the side that's bright it's gonna be very hot as soon as you walk over into the dark area, it's going to be super, super cold. Let me turn my phone off. I forgot to do that. Whoops-a-daisy. So there's Mercury up close. Let's find our next victim. I mean visiting spot. Venus, the beautiful planet Venus. There we are. Here we see Venus. Now, Venus is interesting. Venus rotates in the opposite direction. What do I mean by that? I said earlier, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. On Venus, the sun rises in the west and sets in the east. Also of interest, the day on Venus is almost as long as its year. What do I mean by that? Well, a day on Earth is 24 hours. 24 Earth hours, right? Well, a day on Venus is over 220 days. Earth days. Planet slowly rotates backwards. It has an atmosphere of carbon dioxide, which means it retains a lot of heat. It's just 900 degrees Fahrenheit all the time. It's always hot. Any probes that have landed on the planet have melted. Never a fun existence. <clears throat> what if Venus is this uh, uh, chat note here? Let's see here. What if Venus is just upside down and the sun still rises in the I mean, yeah, if you could just uh, flip it upside down, there you go, that's, that's the solution. That's thinking with your head, that's thinking with portals, buddy! Let's slow this down a little bit, let's take a look at Earth. One thing we didn't really talk about, because we haven't really looked at the sky truly yet, is what's called the light pollution. In space, up is, a relative, is relative and subjective. That is actually not incorrect. <laughs> Up is however you want to orient. So the way we, we kind of look at things is, you know, North Pole is up, South Pole is down, because that's what we consider our planet to be. And so that's how we roll with it. Now, this is this is Earth with North up top and South at the bottom. You're right. It could just be upside down if you look at things the other way. And I don't think I can actually flip this over that way. So let's see. Can I do that? Yeah, no, it, it actually won't let me flip the thing over. Darn. Nonetheless, let's take a look at 
the Earth at night, which is going to be showing up slowly and surely here. Let's slow this down a little bit more. Uh, this is the result of humanity doing humanity things. I learned things from Homeworld. Well, see, you can learn from just about anywhere. If you really want to. Looking at the planet Earth, you can actually see us. Normally, when you look at the Earth from the, sp uh, from the sky, from space, uh, you just see, you know, surface, some surface details, and you'll see clouds. You don't really see a lot of human-made structures. Until you look at night. And then the glow of our cities will be easily seen. So you can actually see, like, there's Tokyo and Osaka. There's Seoul. Mumbai. You see Cairo and all along the River Nile in Egypt. Europe, very well lit up. Not a lot of dark skies, it looks like. That's unfortunate. The darker these areas are, the better the sky actually looks. So if you want to see things the way they're meant to be seen, you want to go out into the middle of nowhere. Which is unfortunate. You know, not everybody can travel out to the middle of nowhere. We'll talk more about that when we get back to the planetarium, but we're getting sidetracked. Let's go back to Mars. There we go. Hello, Mars. So this is the planet Mars, which we just talked about. There's Valles Marineris, the Mariner Valley, right around the surface. And this is actually the region you'll be able to see tonight through a telescope, if your telescope's powerful enough. There's the Tharsis region of Mars. There's Olympus Mons, being the behemoth that it actually is. Now, out past Mars, you will find the orbit of the asteroids, and all my orbits are gone, and I don't know why, so there's an easy solution. Reload the simulation. My apologies. Let's slow it down again. There we go. So, actually, this is even better, because we're at the right place. This is the asteroid belt. There's a couple of huge asteroids uh, that are actually named, like Ceres. Palace. Uh, chat, what do we got? Uh, NK, North Korea has fantastic light pollution. Yeah, you're actually not wrong. There is no light pollution there for various reasons. It would be a good place to view the sky. It probably would not be a good place to get to, though. <laughs> there. <laughs> That's a fun travel idea, right? Hey, don't do that. Please don't do that. You could get in trouble, and you might not come back. Let's go to the outer solar system. These are the outer planets. This is the gas, the realm of the giants. The gas giant planets. This is Jupiter. It's actually kind of a low-res Jupiter, and it upsets me slightly. It actually looks like it's painted. Uh, there's the great red spot, which is not visible tonight, unfortunately. But again, this is a gas giant planet, so the next four planets we're going to look at, they are not solid surfaces that you could land on. You just get to see atmospheric disturbances. The one thing I don't like about this simulation is Saturn doesn't have its rings, and I don't know why. There it is. There's the ringless Saturn. This is not how it looks. It does have this weird hexagonal shape up top. Uh, but there should be rings on this planet, and I don't know why. I've checked, and I've loaded everything, and it does have everything loaded, but for some reason it doesn't load rings. I don't know why, so it upsets me, so we're just going to leave Saturn alone. Uranus and Neptune are the next two planets we're going to talk about. Uranus is the other oddball in the solar system, so much like uh, Venus, Uranus has some very strange features, and by that I mean we're not looking at the planet from the side. The planet is tipped over onto its side, so this is actually the North Pole. Half of its year as it orbits around the sun, uh, the North Pole faces the sun, and then half of the year the South Pole faces the sun. The whole planet's tipped over on its side, no one's sure why. Uh, the ring system and the uh, moons also follow the equator, so they are actually tipped over on their side as well. So either the entire solar system got tipped over and Uranus is fine, or Uranus got tipped over and the rest of the solar system's fine. Chat note, let's see here. What are your thoughts on the theory that the gas giants actually have a solid core hidden in the center? That's actually probably very, very true. You can't land on the surface of these things, so to speak. What you see is not 
physical surface, it's cloud, there's likely some sort of core, some sort of compressed core, maybe a small rocky core or icy core. Uh, heavily pressurized. As you enter into the atmospheres, you're going to face a huge amount of pressure and get crushed like a can uh, underfoot. Good example of this. If you ever load up an old DOS game called Starflight, one of my most favorite games of all time, uh, you could sometimes land on different planets, and it would even let you approach and try to land on gas giants, and you would just instantly go down and crush and get killed. <clears throat> Rip. Ripperoni pizza. Pizza covered in little tombstones. Here we have Neptune, the final of the gas giants. It is the blue planet. That's the name... A, uh, the, the name Neptune. The, the god of the sea, or Poseidon, if you want to call him that. Uh, chat says, Clark theorized a diamond core. You are correct. So imagine that. Try to go mine diamonds on, on one of these large gas giant planets. We honestly don't know what's below the atmosphere. It's very, very thick. There are plenty of hypotheses. Most of them do have some sort of solid core. Uh, the extent of that solid core, we're not really sure. Got to keep doing some more studies on that. Uh, Neptune is interesting because it seems to be shrinking in some sort of way because there's actually cloud disturbances. They didn't put it in here, but there is a great dark spot. Much like Jupiter has a great red spot, there's actually a dark spot on, on Neptune uh, that shouldn't be there. But it is. Now, as you come out this far, you notice that there are some other objects with names on them. Pluto is probably the one that you care about the most. Because uh, it used to be a planet, but it no longer is a planet. Still, we're doing this to show you that all the planets appear to be on a nice flattened out plane, except for these outliers like Pluto and... Sedna and Quawar, these things that are called trans-Neptunian objects. This is the plane of the ecliptic. This is the reason we have the zodiac. This is why they all travel a nice flattened out plane from our point of view, that nice flat line in the sky. It's just a bunch of Endermen. Yes, that's exactly what's at the core of the planets. <laughs> uh, that would be terrifying. Now, our star, the sun, is just a small yellow, what we call a yellow dwarf star. You notice it's right here in the middle. And you'll see a huge cloud in the background. That cloud is the Milky Way. As we orbit around the sun during the summer months, we look this direction, towards the core, the heart of our galaxy. During the winter months, we orbit around, and we actually are looking more out towards this direction, the edge of our galaxy. What do I mean by that? Mm, well, we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Again, if you have any questions, doesn't matter which platform you're on, Facebook, Twitch, or YouTube, just type in chat and I will hopefully be able to see all of them. Uh, I do see them popping up. It looks like, ah, yes, yeah, so if I click here, it looks like I can actually uh, see where they come from. So I see they're all coming from Twitch so far. That's good. Got to get some more traffic on the other channels, which would be great. Looks like I can only reply to Twitch, though. Interesting. All right, let's get back to the planetarium. But again, feel free to stop me at any time. I appreciate any interaction y'all will give me. Hopefully you have a nice little snack and a drink. Uh, we've got some green tea and some healthy granola to keep us going for this show. All right, let's get back to our planetarium, shall we? Work is actually happening today, yep. People come and go, man. Gotta do what you gotta do. Appreciate you stopping by. Have a good one. All right. Here we are once again in our planetarium. Now, you take care of yourself, friend. Don't work too hard. 
Yeah, I know it's a new year, you want to be impressive, but don't work too, too hard. All right, here we are again tonight, just after sunset. And we are again looking south, southeast this time. And the reason I'm doing this is I want to show you possibly my favorite part of the sky. Because it's so easy to find your way around. Now, it does depend on where you live. And by that I mean, let's see, where's my little configuration thing? That's the wrong one. <laughs> That's the wrong one. Sorry about that. Still the wrong one. There we go. All right, so we talked about light pollution. We looked at the Earth at night from space, and we saw city lights. Well, we can simulate that in here. If you're in the middle of a very, very light-polluted city, you might have something like this. You might only be able to see a couple of stars. You will be able to see planets, but you won't be able to see much. You'll only be able to see the brightest of stars. If you travel outside of a city or between cities, or if you go out into a nice... Let's say forested area or a wooded area, campground, for example, you might get something more like this. You see a lot more dim stars, you see a lot more bright stars. The brighter stars, I should say, just look brighter. And the dimmer stars all show up. Now, long ago, this is what the sky looked like for everybody. And various cultures from around the world looked at the sky and came up with stories. They didn't just see points of light. What they saw were various shapes, what we like to call constellations. Now, these were deities. They were, you know, beasts, great humans, hunter, like Orion the Great Hunter, for example, or the water bearer Aquarius. But this is what we consider a Western sky. Now, Western constellations are what are officially recognized. And there's 88 of them total, but they're not the only ones in the sky. And that all depends, again, on your culture. So we're going to bounce through and look at some other things. So let's look at Chinese version of the sky. Same exact sky, same thing tonight, but these are constellations that are Chinese in origin. Unfortunately, some of these are incomplete databases, so they will be missing things. There's Lakota. Lakota and Dakota. So Native American or First Nations up in Canada. Uh, Sami, they're up in, I believe, Finland, something like that. Navajo, the great Navajo Nation, part of my state. Dine. So again, this is just that aside, there's more than just what we call the constellations. These, again, are the Western constellations. Uh, these are all sky stories, and I think they're really cool because it gives you an, an idea of what other cultures saw. It lets you learn about literature and history, anthropology. Uh, so astronomy kind of leads into other things. It's kind of a gateway into other things. Astronomy is likely one of the oldest of sciences. Now, astrology and astronomy are two different things. Astrology is usually based around the constellations that are in the zodiac and it has to do with divination and future you know fortune telling and you know astromancy that kind of stuff astronomy is more of you know saying what's in the sky and figuring out where things are uh where to find them and then there's astrophysics which is the actual you know doing the maths involved in how things move how they form and those all lead again into other things. You have, you know, chemical sciences, so you have chemistry and uh, biology. Astrobiology is a subject. Uh, again, history and anthropology, and of course, art. I love art. My wife is an artist. And all of these things are inspiring to people to do artwork, make cool videos, and make uh, cool paintings. So astronomy leads you into lots of different things. And hopefully, after seeing the next couple of minutes, you'll be able to at least find your way around the sky. If you've never looked at the sky before, you'll be able to find a couple of constellations, a couple of really bright stars, and, you know, start your journey as an amateur astronomer. So we're going to wait a couple of minutes here. You will see satellites and things going by. 
couple of moments here. I just want to get a couple of things rising up into the sky here. There we go. Now, the easiest target in the winter sky is Constellation Orion. Orion, the great hunter. Uh, lots of different stories about him. Some say his he was, you know, the loved one of uh, Artemis, the moon. And uh, she was challenged by her brother Apollo to shoot a target very, very far away. That target happened to be Orion swimming in a pool or a lake. And uh, she killed him, and in her grief, she put him up in the sky as a constellation. Others uh, have him uh, pledging to kill all the creatures of the planet Earth, and uh, him being beset with a, with a large scorpion that ends up stinging him and killing him. Uh, there is a scorpion constellation that is Scorpio. It is visible in the summer. Uh, that's supposedly the explanation why Orion's in the winter and Scorpio's in the summer. A lot of times you'll see him either with a sword and a shield uh, fighting with Taurus the Bull, this large bull-shaped constellation up here. Uh, other times you'll see him with an unbreakable club holding a lion's pelt, always with his two hunting dogs, Canis Major, the big dog, and Canis Minor, the little dog, right down over there. Let's get rid of these shapes and look at the stars. And again, just drawing out the outlines. There we go. Orion is easily found because of an asterism. Now, an asterism is a shape that you can find in the sky that's not a constellation. Uh, Orion's belt is considered an asterism. There's also the Winter Triangle, the Big Dipper, and the Little Dipper. Well, the Big Dipper in particular is an asterism. It's not a constellation. It's part of a bigger thing called a constellation. Uh, Big Dipper is part of Ursa Major, the Big Bear. We'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, let's take a look here. Let's draw the three lines for Orion's belt through Onitak, Onilam, and Mintaka, the three stars of Orion's belt. We can use Orion to find many, 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 many things during the evening sky in the winter. Uh, his shoulder star up here is named Betelgeuse or Betelgeese. It is a bright red colored star. It's a red giant star, a star nearing the end of its lifetime. Opposite of his shoulder, down here you find Rigel, it's a very bright blue star. Uh, it is a star that is, you know, young and hot. Hot. Uh, much hotter than our sun. Uh, stars that are blue are hotter than the sun. Stars that are red are colder than the sun. So think of the uh, the rainbow, Roy G. Biv, right? Red, orange, yellow, blue, indigo, and violet. Uh, red, orange stars, those are all colder than the sun. Uh, the sun is yellow, so it's in the middle there. Uh, then you got your green stars, and a couple of them, there are not a lot of them. Uh, then you got blue, and then indigo and violet. So blue and blue-white stars are going to be very, very hot, very young. They don't live as long. Let's look at Orion. His other shoulder is Bellatrix, and then Safe is the last star down here. So we got Betelgeuse, Bellatrix, Rigel, and Safe, making the outer portion of Orion. Alnitak, Alnilam, and Mintaka actually going this direction. Mintaka's up here. Those are all the seven stars of Orion. Don't worry about their names. Just wanted to say that they were there. Now, let's use Orion to find our way around, shall we? Let's use the belt. Draw a line through the belt and go this direction. You will find a V of stars. This V of stars is called the Hyades. This is the face of Taurus the Bull with a bright red star named Aldebaran. The eye of Taurus the Bull right there, his bright red eyeball. If you keep drawing that line from Orion's belt all the way through the Hyades, you will find a little cluster of stars. This is what is called an open star cluster. Riding on the back of Taurus the Bull, they are the Pleiades, or the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters, Subaru. Electra and Selaneo. Selaneo. I can pronounce it. Pleon. Merope. Merope. And Alcyone. That's the name of the cat. If you were paying attention earlier, that's our cat's name. Uh, this is an open star cluster. This is a cluster of young, mostly blue stars. They're all fairly related to each other. They're all kind of spread apart, floating around on their own. So that's on the back of Taurus, the bull. Let's go back to Orion. 
Let's go the opposite direction. So we used the belt and went to the right, so to speak, so more towards the west. Let's take Orion's belt and draw a line towards the eastern horizon. Go this way. Well, if you do that, you're going to find a nice bright, super bright star. Seriously, it's really bright. In fact, that star is named Sirius. That is the name of my doggy, my dachshund. This is Sirius the dog star. Canis Major, the big hunting dog of Orion, right down there. If you can find Sirius and you can find Orion, obviously you did because that's where we started, you're going to be able to make a triangle. So we go from Sirius back up to Betelgeuse. There's one side of the triangle, and you'll notice that there's a little star over here named Procyon. Uh, this bright star, a little bit more of a yellowish colored star, this completes your triangle. This is called the Winter Triangle. You start to see it uh, as winter begins to approach, kind of late in the fall. Uh, this Winter Triangle is up throughout the entire winter months. Uh, that is an asterism, the triangle. Uh, and you'll notice the Milky Way travels right through this triangle right along here. And you've also found Canis Minor, the little constellation uh, known as the little dog, Canis Minor. Uh, it's just Procyon and one other star. That's it. It's a hot dog. It's a toxin. I should have named him Procyon instead. Back to Orion. All right, let's use Orion to find something else. This time we're going to find another zodiac constellation. So Taurus is a zodiac constellation, and so are the Gemini twins. To find them... Draw a line from Rigel through Betelgeuse and the belt and keep going and you'll notice you end up over here. There's two parallel stars. One is named Castor. The other is named Pollux. These are the Gemini twins. And again, you notice the Zodiac travels right through them. Through Taurus, through Gemini, and then through this is Cancer the Crab. Cancer is actually really hard to see. Uh, these stars are not very bright at all. But just using Orion, we have found one, two, three, four other constellations. Well, technically five if you include Cancer. Look at that. So again, Orion's a really, really helpful tool uh, in the winter sky. It's also a very fruitful thing to look at through a telescope. So if you happen to have a telescope, I really want you to take a look at Orion's belt. Well, just below the belt. If you look at Orion's belt, which we've zoomed in on, there's the three stars of the belt right there. Just below the center star, you'll notice there's a little patch. In fact, if we zoom back out, you can kind of see even out here, you can still see it. This little patch is actually a stellar nursery. There are lots of little baby stars. Look at them. This is what is called the Great Nebula in Orion. Now... It's hard to understand what it looks like. It just looks like a like a rose petal or something, right? I want you to take your hands if you if you can, put your put your palms together, and imagine you're trying to hold water. So you make like a little cup out of your hands. That's kind of what's going on here. In the middle of your palm, or in the middle of this, is a thing called the trapezium. It's, uh, this thing is actually four stars, all kind of in a trapezoidal shape. And they are illuminating, they're heating up this cloud. This cloud is actually glowing like a neon bulb. And eventually, millions of years from now, this cloud will be gone. Because all of this will either be burned off or, you know, some of it will collapse and form new stars. Nearby there's a reflection nebula, much like uh, the nebula around the Pleiades, a little blue cloud right here. Uh, this is going to be the Running Man Nebula. Looks like a dude jumping over a star. Coming back up, we're still looking in the region of Orion. you got the three stars making Orion's belt, but we're now zoomed in very, very close. It's three, three stars. Uh, just below Alnitak, the leftmost star of the belt, you find this nebula. It's another good look at the types of nebulas that are out there. You've got a reflection nebula. Anytime you see a bluish cloud, this is going to be a reflection nebula. When you see clouds that are glowing red, you're looking at emission nebula. An emission nebula is actually a cloud of gas that's actually being heated up or illuminated. And 
It's being excited, I should say. And as that happens, this cloud is actually glowing, just like a neon bulb. So the, the actual molecules are giving off light and glowing. They change colors, depending on what molecules are excited. And then you got this darkened nebula. This is actually just going to be dust floating around. Uh, this kind of looks like a scorpion's tail, but for the longest time, this is actually going to be called the horse's head. This is the horse head nebula. In Orion, tonight. There's a bunch of other stuff with lots of red, uh, lots of star forming regions over here. There's also what's called the Witch's Head Nebula near the star Rigel. Right over here. Very, very cool. But yeah, that's just looking at this one region of the sky. All this again, stuff in our own Milky Way galaxy. Uh, there is a galaxy out tonight that is not, I mean, there's plenty of galaxies that are out that aren't part of our Milky Way. Uh, one of them you can actually see without a telescope if you're out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it's also one that's very important. That's the, actually the next subject we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about some deep sky stuff. We've rotated things and we're now looking north. Uh, we always like to show you how to find the North Star, the Pole Star, the Load Star. Uh, to find it, you can either use the Big Dipper, which at sunset is usually below the horizon at the moment for the most part, depending on where you live. Or you can use this three or W shape up here, or an M. Uh, this is going to be Cassiopeia, the queen. She's up here, sitting on her throne. Let's grab our little thing here and draw this line out. So here you see this M shape, pretty obvious. There's not a lot of other things that are bright in this part of the sky. If you can use the equal-sided triangle, draw a line through the middle of it, you end up going this direction towards the horizon. You will find this star. You know you're looking at the right star if you can find the Big Dipper. Now, again, it depends on if the Big Dipper is visible to you. Uh, the Big Dipper is not a constellation. It is an asterism. It is also super easy to find. It's one of the more obvious things in the sky. Uh, there are three stars in its tail and then four stars in its cup. There's the cup. These last two stars we call the pointer stars, for they will point you to Polaris. That is the same star that we found using this triangle. So there's from one side, here's from the other side. This is the pole star. This is the north star. This is the load star. This is the guiding light. This is the star that never sets. All of the stars that are in its immediate vicinity, they never go below the horizon unless you are really close to the equator. As we let the sky rotate, you'll notice... Again, stars rising and setting, but these all stay pretty much in the same part of the sky. Circumpolar, that is called, as they circle the pole. That's what makes the North Star so important. Now, it hasn't always been the North Star. Our Earth is tilted over slightly, and it does point at different stars, uh, depending on the epoch, and actually long ago it was a star named Thuban, which is actually this star right here in Draco the Dragon. Oh, the sun has come out. Is there a way to get rid of the atmosphere? There we go. Just keep looking at the sky. There we go. So this used to be the North Star. That's Thuban. Uh, it's drifted this far, so there's kind of a circle in itself that the Earth points at. As we orbit around our sun, this takes years and years and years, 26,000 years, I think, is the number uh, for that circle. Now, really quickly, this again is from my point of view here. Uh, the North Star is only about 35 degrees above the horizon from my point of view here. If you live somewhere else, this will be different. So, for example, if you live in... Fairbanks, Alaska. Much higher up. You'll notice that the North Star is almost 65 degrees, so it's t almost twice as high in the sky. Uh, if you live in Miami, I don't know why you do that, but if you live in Miami, it's only going to be 25 degrees above the horizon. Uh, let's see what else. Arecibo. If you live in Adecibo, it's going to be even lower. It's only going to be 19 degrees. So the closer you get to the equator, the lower the North Star is in the sky. The closer you get to the poles, the higher the North Star gets in the sky from your point of view. Let's come back to my location. Return to default. 
There we go. Let's get our atmosphere back. Yep, going to be really bright. Yikes. Let's get back to sunset. Now, the whole point of this exercise was to find another galaxy. Our Milky Way is not on its own. There are other galaxies nearby in what we call the local group of galaxies. And there's also a much larger group called the Virgo Cluster. Now, to find this galaxy that you can see without a telescope, although if you have a telescope, it'll look a little bit better, you want to find either this great square in the sky, this is the great square of Pegasus, or again, you want to go back to Cassiopeia. Now, if you don't have these lines, which you won't, you'll notice there is a square of stars in the sky right over here. One, two, three, four, so that's a square. And again, we have our M or W shape in the sky making Cassiopeia. If we have these, this equal sided triangle, these three stars, draw a line through the point and head this way. Or if you have your great square, go one, two, three. Count three stars, one, two, three, one, two, three. You end up in the same exact place this was once called the Andromeda Nebula. It's actually in the constellation Andromeda, but it is not a nebula at all. Once te technology kind of improved and people were able to take photos of the sky, what you have here is actually the Andromeda Galaxy. It doesn't look like that through a telescope. You need to take many, many photos and overlay them on each other uh, to make that look like the spiral galaxy that it is. Uh, also, with this galaxy, you will notice that there is actually a smaller galaxy nearby. That is an elliptical galaxy, an associated galaxy. Galaxies tend to kind of group together, cluster together uh, in space around the bigger channels altogether. Bigger channels. Around the bigger uh, galaxies, I should say. So let's take a look at this up close. So let's look at our Milky Way from above and then go from there. So from our point of view, we only see a little piece. It looks like a little stripe through the sky. However, let's take a look. Let's go back over here. So there's the Milky Way in the background. Let's take a look at the Milky Way this way. There we go. There's the Milky Way. What we think it looks like this is a spiral galaxy. As you see, it looks like a big pinwheel. There are variations in these things. We're just using a general idea of what a spiral galaxy looks like. There's also what's called a barred spiral. There's actually a odd uh, linear structure in the central portion of the galaxy. But for our purposes, we're just going to use this. So our star, the sun, is just a single little tiny star along the outer edges of a galaxy like this. As you look at it from the edge, you see you don't see the galaxy spiral arms anymore. You see just right along the edge. That's kind of what we see from our point of view, so that means we've got to be out in one of these arms. You'll notice there are older, redder, colder stars near the core, both above and below the, horizon, uh, the equator of the galaxy itself. They travel through the galaxy, and everything else kind of spirals around it. Now, our Milky Way is in what is called the local group of galaxies. The local group looks kind of like this. You kind of zoomed out a little bit, and there's the Milky Way once again. You see there's a Sagittarius Dwarf galaxy. There's all these little galaxies. Now, if you live in the southern hemisphere, you've probably seen what are called the Large and Small Magellanic Cloud. The large cloud's actually further away. It's way down here, but it's bigger, so it looks bigger in the sky. Now, the Small Magellanic Cloud's a little bit further back. Let's see, where are you? This is the problem with three-dimensional space. You can get lost really easily. There's the Milky Way. Let's go back to our galaxy. There we go. So this is our little home cluster, so to speak. But I thought we were talking about Andromeda. Well, Andromeda is part of this cluster as well. And Andromeda is way up here. You see, Andromeda has a couple of galaxies with it. Come on. There we go. There's the Andromeda galaxy. And there's the companion galaxy that's with it. So what does this have to do with anything? 
Well, w these galaxies are all kind of in the same cluster. I call it again the local group of galaxies. And they're all kind of dancing with each other. In fact, Andromeda and our galaxy, the Milky Way, are so attracted to each other that millions of years from now, this will happen. Right now, it takes 2.25 million years at the speed of light to get from the Milky Way to the Andromeda Galaxy. But in millions of years, this will happen, where the Andromeda Galaxy and our Milky Way will combine. They will turn into this huge mesh, a conglomerate of both of the galaxies, and of course the little satellites that are with them will also get merged and crushed together. You'll notice some stars and gas material will be thrown out into space, into deep space. Really, really cool. This is the merger of the Milky Way and the Andromeda Galaxy, simulated. But that's not happening for millions of years, so don't worry, don't panic about that. But there we go. That's kind of a look at what's going on in the sky, and some of the beautiful objects you'll be able to see. Again, if you've never looked at the night sky, it's easy to do. Just go outside, look up. If your sky is clear, use some of the tips we talked about in this show to help you find your way around. This is designed to be a planetarium show for people who have never seen the sky before, or maybe needed a refresher course, or maybe you're not able to get outside. Maybe you're in a hospital, or maybe you're in a nursing home. And of course, it's really hard to get out and do things as a group now with everything going on in the world, so that's why we're doing this online to get people interested in astronomy. If you have any questions at any point, feel free to ask me. Uh, we usually do hour, hour and a half long shows, give or take. We've done about an hour and 15 today. The more people in chat, the more we can talk, and the longer the shows end up, and that's quite all right. Please, if you can, share this channel to your friends and family. Anybody that has a passing interest, I try to do this Mondays and Wednesdays for, like I said, a good two-hour block if possible. Uh, Fridays, I also do a two-hour block, but that's more of a news show, so we talk more about any science or news-related topics and kind of do open lines, so to speak, talk about whatever people want to talk about. But, uh, yeah. Thanks for joining us on our first show of the year. Our YouTube page will be uploading new videos in the next few days. Uh, please click on them, like, and subscribe there. Uh, we do have a Facebook page. It's a facebook.com slash earth sign education, one word. And, of course, here on Twitch, we are trying to grow the channel. I'd uh, love to make this into a full-time job doing astronomy stuff every day and teaching Astronomy 101, doing lessons. Um, that's kind of the goal, but I do have to recreate the lessons because I can't use prepackaged ones from college textbooks because those are copyright. So, going to work on those and get them done. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to post them at any point during our shows. I think the few that were here, again, we appreciate you being here. The few that were here have gone away. They've gone back to work, and that is great. So with that, we're going to go ahead and end our show. Nice, quick, and easy. We'll talk about some of the same subjects and some new ones on Wednesday. And on Friday, we'll talk about the news. And so, I'm going to leave you with this. We hope you had a wonderful time. We hope you are doing well wherever you are. We are powered by the sun. I'm 
obsessed with the stars. Obsessed with the moon. I'm obsessed with all of you. Our friends, our family, fellow humans. And anybody that maybe isn't human out there in the great beyond that may be picking this up somehow. We hope you have a pleasant day, morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you happen to be. Take care of yourself, take care of each other, and may you have love and clear skies. We'll see you next time.